Hello, dear partners. We are about to start. I thank you very much for attending this webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask them in the chat. We'll make sure to provide answers at the end of the webinar during our Q&A session. The focus of today's webinar is about scanning large objects. So let's begin by defining what is to be considered a large object. Interestingly, this classification depends not only on the object itself, but also on the type of scanner being used. Let's take a donut or bagel, for example, like you see here on the right, measuring nine to 10 centimeters in diameter. Would you call this a large object? Well, it actually depends. For the micro scanner, this is a very large object that will barely fit into the micro's field of view, will result in a massive amount of data and potentially lengthy post-processing times. But for a space spider, this same donut falls into the medium size category and scanning and post-processing it will be a walk in the park. And as for an EVA or LEO scanner, the same donut will be considered a small object. So in reality, the object size is very relative depending on which scanner is being used for the job. Now, in recent months, we received a number of how-to inquiries regarding the scanning of vehicles and even small boats preferably with a single scanner. For most people, the single scanner happens to be the LEO, probably because it is a fairly universal scanner in terms of the scope of objects and sizes that it can cover. The Ray is also a worthy candidate, and you probably remember that we recently did a webinar on combined scanning with LEO plus Ray and talked about the accuracy benefits that this approach offers. But for some customers who are only doing a one-off large scanning project, their single project doesn't always justify the acquisition of array. Alternatively, the ACON scan reference or hexagon DPA photogrammetry kits are also an option for improving the accuracy of large LEO scans. While the additional cost is minor, these kits are a bit of a hassle to use. Therefore, they are mostly and primarily used by customers who either use targets in their workflow anyway. So for example, that would be automotive design and manufacturing, or customers who just really need that additional accuracy. So in short, the LEO is the weapon of choice for most customers aiming to scan a large vehicle or boat sized object. Knowing this, we LEO scanned and post-processed a couple of vehicles in preparation for this webinar. I'll be showing you these today. We also tossed in a ray scan just for good measure, but most of the webinar will be talking about the LEO. Here are the main scans that we will be discussing today. That's a Mercedes CLK convertible and a Mustang 1900R compact loader. Now, possibly by combining these two fusions, we could have gotten a Mustang convertible. Just imagine that for a moment. But jokes aside, both vehicles were scanned with the LEO in HD mode. The approach that we used for scanning these vehicles was fairly simple and is applicable to most, if not all, vehicle scans. <clears throat> First, you have to logically subdivide the object into zones or areas and plan your scanning trajectory. Then you must spray 
any difficult to scan areas of the vehicle, add features if necessary, and you need to plan ahead how you're going to scan inaccessible areas. Next, you must adjust the LEO settings to match your requirements. Then you pick up the LEO and you start scanning. And of course, finally, you should transfer the scan data to a powerful PC and post-process it. Planning the scanning trajectory is one of the key steps for success. While watching an experienced scanning technician do his job, it may look like he just picks up the scanner and starts randomly scanning the vehicle. But in fact, there is nothing random about it. So in your mind, before you even begin scanning, the vehicle should be subdivided into logical zones or areas. These areas should not be too large in order to keep the number of frames per scan at a manageable level. And don't forget to make sure that there is sufficient overlap between your individual areas. Remember that when using the LEO, you can stop the scan at any moment and later continue right where you left off. Now this is thanks to the continuous scanning feature, which automatically recognizes previously scanned areas and allows you to seamlessly continue scanning, even if the new data is actually being recorded into a new subscan. And this is exactly what I did when scanning the convertible. I would completely scan an area that I had laid out in my head. Once done with that area, I would briefly stop the scan. Then I would press the trigger again and continue with the next neighboring area. On the LEO, these individual yet auto-aligned scans are called subscans, but the user sees them as a single scan. This makes it very convenient to track your progress by looking at the on-screen real-time fusion result that the LEO shows you during scanning and that it keeps building on to. That's the result that you see here on the right. But once imported into RTEC Studio, each of those subscans will appear as an individual scan inside the same group. So nicely logically grouped and yet separate. These scans representing the logically separate areas that you scanned previously can then be individually viewed, global registered, analyzed, etc., giving you a better overview and just more control over the process. On a side note, I should mention some limitations of this approach. Stopping the scan, then pressing the LEO trigger to continue creates a new subscan. But this is all still happening inside the same LEO project. So if your object is excessively large, this may later create issues at the import step. Because in the current iteration of the software, you only have the choice of importing and running the HD conversion on a full LEO project. You cannot selectively pick out scans from that project. So keep in mind your total LEO project size and adapt your approach accordingly. If the object is simply too large for, import, uh, for importing within one project, then subdivide it into multiple LEO projects that can later be imported one at a time. In the case of this convertible, I subdivided in everything into three LEO projects that you can see here. So project eight is the entire front half of the vehicle, including the front half of the interior. So the driver and passenger seats. We're talking about the convertible here. Project nine is the rear half of the vehicle, including the rear half of the interior. And then project 10 was scanned only after I had already imported and taken a good look at projects eight and nine. 
It contains small elements that needed additional attention, like a section of the dashboard and the exterior edges of the A pillars that support the windshield. I'll provide more details on this later on in the presentation. Also, please note that the massive file sizes shown here represent the entire raw data set, encompassing both SD and HD scans. I ended up importing only the HD data, which luckily was not quite as large as the entire data set. Scanning trajectory. So that's what we'll talk about right now. Scanning trajectory is just as important as the subdivision of the scanning object into zones or areas. And here is a real life example to illustrate the difference between a good and a bad scanning approach. A long while ago, when the LEO scanner was just being released, I took it outside and attempted a scan of my station wagon. Considering that this station wagon is a good five meters long, you could easily call it a boat, hence making this experiment just as useful for people who wish to scan boats. Anyways, so I first started with the most mindless and unplanned approach possible. I began my scan on the left side of the radiator and walked around the car in a loop while moving the scanner up and down to generally capture the hood, roof, etc. Expectedly, the result was bad. Because if you look closely at the radiator grill and the license plates in the top left there, you will notice that they are so seriously misaligned that they are stretched out to about 1.5 times their original size. But this wasn't the scanner's fault because bad scanning approach equals bad result. So after pondering for a minute on what I had done, I tried a different approach. Starting with the radiator grill again, I gradually scanned a bit of the left fender wheel and part of the hood, then returned to the edge of the radiator grill and proceeded to the other side of the car in the same way and returned to the edge of the radiator grill again. And using this method, which basically consists of regularly showing the scanner an area that it has previously seen, I gradually advanced to the back of the car. This sketch that you see right here with the arrows shows a rough representation of what I did. I mean, the arrows are a little bit exaggerated, so don't take it as an absolute approach to vehicle scanning. But the point is that this time around, the result was perfect. There was no noticeable error accumulation whatsoever. Processing the data in Ardex Studio also confirmed that the scan had been a success. And the resulting 3D model of this vehicle can be found somewhere in our online view shape galleries. Now, here is an extract from one of our training documents, which explains in an easier to understand fashion what it is exactly that I was doing that made such a world of difference. Regularly returning to a previously scanned area drastically reduces error accumulation and data warping. Always keep this in mind whenever you're scanning a large object. And please do not scan in a loop as I did on my first try. And here is a more interactive version of what you just saw, illustrating both the correct and incorrect scanning trajectories. I'll let you look at this slide for some seconds. On the left, we are constantly scanning without ever returning to a previously scanned area. And that creates insufficient overlap and you accumulate a lot of error. On the right, we are regularly returning and showing the scanner an area that it has seen before, which greatly improves the accuracy of the overall result. Continuing our workflow. Point two, 
I'd say that there are three main challenges in this following section. Challenge A, the first one, is reflective surfaces. That would be a windshield, the headlights, and sometimes even the vehicle paint itself, depending on its color. B, you may encounter large featureless panels without any significant geometry or texture variations. And C, there may be inaccessible areas or occluded surfaces and such. On the following slides, we will talk about each of these scenarios in detail. So any translucent or reflective areas should be sprayed. I think that's obvious. Preferably, it should be done with a volatile self-evaporating scanning spray, which later allows you to skip the cleaning because it evaporates away on its own. While scanning the convertible, I tested a bunch of different scanning sprays. And incidentally, they all happen to be German made, just like the car that I was scanning. Here are the sprays that I used. There's an A sub blue, an A sub orange, and a number of Reflecon sprays. The A sub blue evaporates away in four hours, or at least that's what it says on the can. In reality, unless you apply an excessively thick layer, it will evaporate much faster. I would say that this spray is good for quick scanning jobs and experienced scanning technicians. The AE Sub Orange, which is a brand new product that AE Sub was so kind to send us for testing, evaporates in 24 hours, according to what is advertised on the can. In reality, it seems to evaporate somewhat faster than promised, but it does indeed stay on significantly longer than the AE Sub Blue which allows for a no rush scanning experience. I'd say that the AE sub orange is a good choice for complex scanning projects that take longer to complete, as well as for novices who are still learning and taking their time with the scanning. As for the Reflecon sprays, I had three different types at hand, a Tarnish 10, Tarnish 11, and Tarnish 12, as you can see them on the picture right here. So the Tarnish 10 was most similar to the A sub blue. Possibly the nozzle was a bit better, allowing it to cover a larger area faster, but that's about it. The Tarnish 11 had an even better dispersion or coverage, but the texture was somewhat too grainy. While this is not an issue for the Leo, this would not be acceptable for the Space Spider. And then the Tarnish 12, it started out fantastically, producing a massive dense cloud of spray that rapidly covered a large area of the car in a decent layer, and that in just mere seconds. But unfortunately, the nozzle of the Tarnish 12 quickly degraded. It first started to spit rainy bits and pieces, and then clogged up completely sadly with half the spray still remaining in the can. So I just guess that this spray wasn't designed to be used nonstop for a period exceeding, I guess, one minute. While it was working, I loved it, but sadly it didn't last, the Tarnish 12. Finally, in order to avoid breathing in the spray particles when you're working with it, I strongly recommend wearing a mask, especially if you're working indoors in an enclosed space like I was. Moving on, in case you have large featureless panels with no significant geometry or texture variations, it is highly recommended and in some cases even required to add some features. In the case of my convertible, which due to its body styling has sufficient geometry variations on most panels. And luckily the panels are also fairly small, which is why no additional features or markings were necessary on the convertible. What probably also helped was the uneven spray coat, which provided some additional texture 
thereby further facilitating the tracking. And here's an idea. You could even use your finger to draw crosses by smudging the spray layer, thereby creating additional texture features. Geometry features, especially magnetic ones, can also be used very conveniently, as you can see in the picture with the red car right here. So just keep in mind that on some vehicles with larger, flatter body panels, additional features are a must. Here is a picture of a vehicle that was completely covered in texture references prior to scanning. Uh, now this was an experiment that we performed back in 2015 with an L2 scanner, so not something many will remember. But nevertheless, adding texture references, for example in the form of masking tape crosses, as you see here, is just as valid today as it was back then especially if you should ever need to scan a car with large, flat body panels. And similarly, when scanning a car with an EVA scanner, you will also need denser features because the EVA scanner's field of view and scanning range are both noticeably smaller than those of the LEO. Sometimes, you might find yourself in a situation where you are not allowed to spray or sometimes even touch the vehicle that you're scanning. Just imagine a unique or historical vehicle, for example, or simply something very rare and expensive. In this case, you can resort to using foreground references. This is similar to using an assistive background as you would do, for example, when scanning with the space spider. But in this case, you're placing your assistive elements in front of the scanning object, not behind it. Here's a real life example. So when scanning a number of vintage historical vehicles, one of our partners was not allowed to apply any kind of markings to them. The body panels of the vehicles were too flat and too reflective to be scanned on their own. So our partner bought a bunch of orange traffic cones, similar to the ones you see in my picture, and used a black marker to cover the cones in crosses and place these cones alongside the vehicles pretty close to the vehicle itself. The scanner was then able to easily track the cones with their crosses while scanning the vehicle in the process. I actually used a similar trick when scanning the convertible. So in order to scan the hood ornament, the Mercedes star properly, it needed to be scanned from all sides. The issue here was that this ended up with me pointing the scanner practically into the void where no other references were in the field of view apart from the star. And you see that on the picture on the left. Obviously, this would lead to immediate tracking loss, as the star is too small of an object to be tracked on its own by the LEO. The solution? We dragged up a large fire extinguisher that you see on the right. It just happened to be placed nearby. And we put it in front of the car. This allowed me to point the scanner at the rear side of the star while using the fire extinguisher as a tracking aid. As you can see here, two different positions of the fire extinguisher were necessary in order to cover the star from all angles. On this, on this Leo screenshot, the star is circled in red, while the yellow lines represent how the scanner was pointing during each of the two positions of the fire extinguisher. And the result came out pretty well. Now remember, this is a LEO scan, and the star is fairly thin and small. And yet, as you can see, it was captured perfectly and reconstructed correctly from all sides.
Next, we used a similar trick for scanning the top of the A-pillars that hold the windshield in place. So I asked Valeri, our photographer, to place his arm in a fixed position above the A-pillar, and I used his arm as a tracking aid while scanning. Without the arm, the scanner was pointing into the void with the corner of the A-pillar not providing enough surface to ensure reliable tracking. With the arm in the picture, it worked like a charm. Now, let's talk about accessing difficult or inaccessible areas. In my experience, these hard to reach areas are scanned last after the entire vehicle has already been scanned, um, but your approach may differ. Mainly, make sure to identify such areas right from the start and plan ahead on how you're going to deal with them. I have a number of examples of such areas that are hard to access, but can still be scanned very well if the approach is right. One of them you see here is the top of the dashboard, especially right above the speedometer, as well as the backside of the steering wheel. When you're scanning the entire vehicle, the windshield will generally be covered in spray. But in order to capture these areas properly, you'll need a clean, clear windshield. Because the only way to access those areas from the correct scanning angle is by scanning through the windshield, which is exactly what I did on this convertible. Once the spray had evaporated away, I scanned through the windshield in order to get all those areas scanned well. Another example right here are the door panels. These are occluded by the seats and steering wheel when closed, and there is no way that you can scan them properly, especially the inner door handles, unless you, logically, open the doors. I did this in two separate scans after having already scanned the rest of the vehicle, and you are watching the result of the driver door in the video that is running right now. And here, yet another example, the foot wells. These were better accessible with the front doors open as well. And as for the rear foot wells, I moved the front seats forward in order to get better access. All these scans were also done at the very end after the entire convertible had been scanned already. The reason for this is mainly because I was trying to avoid touching the doors or seats or anything until the car had been generally properly scanned. Moving on, let's spend a short moment talking about LEO settings. When you're scanning such large objects, it makes a lot of sense to enable the optimized project size feature. This will help you reduce the collection of redundant data, which in turn will reduce your project size and speed up post-processing. Also, depending on your needs, the object size and the resources of your processing computer, you may choose to enable the HD mode. I scanned the entire convertible in HD with the 1 8th frame setting, meaning that each eighth frame is recorded in HD. And then I imported the data into Arctic Studio with 4x data density, as you can see on the right. The resulting data set ended up being very large, but as you have probably already noticed, it was well worth it. Now we come to that step in the workflow where you just do it pick up the scanner, and you collect your data. The usual recommendations apply here. You have to move your wrist. You have to cover the object from all angles. Don't forget to regularly return to an area that the scanner has already seen before. We talked about this. 
regularly stop the scan in order to subdivide your object into logical sections. And obviously don't forget to have sufficient overlap between each of your sections. You don't need to be a wizard to succeed. Meticulous planning and a well thought through approach will perform wonders during scanning. And this is where we come to the final step in our workflow, and that is post-processing your data. In this specific case, considering that the convertible was scanned in HD entirely, let's just say that this step took a while. We initially started out with a GTX 1050 Ti graphics card, but quickly realized that it was nowhere near good enough. So we promptly swapped it out against an RTX 3060, which significantly improved the situation. The processing PC was equipped with an i9-7900X CPU and 128 gigabytes of RAM, which would still occasionally overflow onto the SSD swap or page file. And before running any resource intensive algorithm, we would also disable the on-screen rendering. You see that in the bottom left image where it says enable 3D rendering, you can disable that. So we disabled that in order to save resources. And then on the right, you have a list of actions performed with their approximate timings. As you probably realize, everything would have been two to three times, two to three times faster had the HD mode not been used. So the import and HD conversion with 4x data density, as I already mentioned, took about three and a half hours and resulted in roughly 30 gigabytes of data. The alignment and other related pre-fusion tasks took around two and a half hours. Then we did a global registration with a key frame ratio of 0.6. The focus on geometry option was enabled and the downsampling was set to 0.3. This took us around two hours. The sharp fusion was performed at one millimeter resolution with hole filling by radius and this took about 1.6 hours. The next step was a small object filter, pretty quick. That took a mere 1.5 minutes, but we also did some other manual cleanups that in summary took about an hour. And finally, a fast mesh simplification to 40 and a half million poly polygons was performed, taking 12 and a half minutes to conclude. And here we get to see the results of all this hard work. This was a team effort uh, which involved members from both our support and training teams. What you're looking at right here, the final file is 40 and a half million polygons or 2.4 gigabytes large. <clears throat> As you've probably noticed, scanning the car in HD made a number of things possible. The thin hood ornament was reconstructed very nicely, as was the radio antenna on the left side of the trunk, and then just a number of other small details that would otherwise have not been captured properly. So you have those palm trees around the rare license plate or the rare model type signage. Then I'll soon get to the seat belt buckles of the rare seats, which you'll see in a moment. And then there's the middle console switches and just a large number of other things that we constructed very nicely thanks to the HD mode. I'll let you finish watching this video. So I'm just panning around the car and showing you the various elements that are noteworthy. So right now here, just take a look at those seatbelt buckles, how those were reconstructed. We're going to turn around and take a look at the other side. There we go. So same here, we see the front and rear seatbelt buckle. 
And just generally, uh, it's a fairly sharp result with the antenna being reconstructed perfectly. And you can even see all edges of all panel gaps reconstructed very well. The steering wheel and the levers behind it are reconstructed perfectly. And here we get back to the hood ornament or the Mercedes star, which I already showed you previously. The windshield with the wiper assembly. So let's take a quick look at the rims. Even the brake discs were partially scanned. The spray obviously helped because those are usually reflective. Let's take a look at the wheels on this side. So same here. You can even fairly clearly read the AMG signage on the wheels. And here, another top view. You can even see the latches where the convertible roof clicks in when you close it. So yeah, that is the result that we were able to achieve and as I suspect that for some of you, the previous video may have been lagging. I've also added some individual screenshots of the convertible. So here, here we have a top, side, and rear view. I'll give you a moment to take a look, but basically it just shows all the same things that we saw in the video. Here's a large screenshot of the interior. And then we have another set of screenshots right here, including yet again, the hood ornaments. And then we also have the front view of the vehicle, an internal view of the rear view mirror and ceiling lamp here at the bottom left. And on the mirror, those are not artifacts. Those are garage door opener buttons. <clears throat> now, as some of you may remember, at the beginning of the webinar, I mentioned that we would also show you a ray scan. We'll get to that in just a second. Meanwhile, some of you may wonder why we didn't also demonstrate the combined scanners workflow for this converter. Now, as I mentioned earlier, due to popular requests, the main point of this webinar was to demonstrate what the LEO can do on its own when scanning a large object. And here it is. It's the exact same convertible, but scanned with the ray scanner. Only the outer body of the car was scanned, so the interior is mostly absent. Seven scans were made by placing the ray in different positions around the car. These scans were aligned first manually by point pairs, and then global registered by geometry ray. And finally, a sharp fusion was done. Interestingly enough, if you look at the headlights and other reflective elements on the car, it appears as if the Ray would have preferred a thicker coat of spray than the Leo. Now, this specific Ray model does not boast a high resolution and beautiful detail that the Leo HD scan had, but let's not forget that the Ray offers great advantages in terms of accuracy and it can be used as an accuracy skeleton for LEO data in order to reduce any error that the LEO may have collected over distance. In case you're interested in combining Ray and LEO data for accuracy purposes or otherwise, I recommend you revisit our previous webinar about combined scanning. Now, let's take a look at another project that we prepared for today's webinar. As I highlighted earlier, it is a Mustang 1900R compact loader. Although the proportions of this vehicle are slightly different from the Mercedes you have just seen, it is also considered a large object, being about two meters tall and three and a half meters long. Now, because at Artec, we don't really own any compact loaders, unfortunately, we had to negotiate with a local building company 
to allow us to access their construction site and scan one of their loaders. Thanks to the persistence of the Artec marketing department, we came to an agreement with the site manager and finally got access to the Mustang 900R loader that you're seeing on the screen right now. And this is just a photo, by the way. The scans are coming right up on the following slides. When it came to scanning this vehicle, the problems that we needed to address were quite similar to those of the Mercedes. As you can see, the loader has a fair share of translucent and shiny surfaces, including the top of the cabin and a number of light reflectors and bolts. Just like with the car, we utilized the most effective way of tackling these issues and simply used scanning spray. So for this particular project, one single can of the AE Sub Blue spray was just enough to cover the problematic areas. Among other challenges that we faced, I'd like to mention that there was a great amount of hard to reach areas, as well as a certain number of hard to scan geometry, such as the back grills or vents and the protective side nets. Overall, the loader had a decent texture and sufficiently good geometry, meaning that we generally didn't bother applying any additional features. There were only two exceptions to this. We applied masking tape to one of the grills or vents in order to facilitate reliable tracking there. And then there was the very top of the vehicle uh, where we added a couple of texture features by simply using the scanning spray. Now, let me elaborate on the scanning process. We started with the step essential to the success of any scanning project, the planning. The entire object was subdivided into 13 separate areas, namely the wheels, which is one scan per wheel, the lower parts of both sides of the vehicle, that's one scan per lower side, then the upper parts of both sides of the vehicle, that's again one scan per upper side, the bucket that you see pictured on the top right here, then the front with its glass, wipers, and headlights, the lower part of the backside, the upper part of the backside, and the top of the cabin. That is the subdivision that we planned for this object. And again, I cannot stress enough the importance of proper trajectory planning as well. Although we did a good job at separating the object into this number of smaller areas, it was still absolutely essential to come up with a suitable scanning trajectory for each one of these areas. The aim is, simply put, to capture their entire surface, ensure proper overlaps between the areas, all while avoiding accumulating too much data. Before I show you the complete final results, let me bring your attention to a couple of areas that we are particularly proud of. Check out the smoothness of the front glass and the fine detail on the windshield wiper arm. Even though we didn't spray the front part too heavily, thanks to the HD mode, we still managed to achieve a pretty impressive reconstruction quality. The wheels look quite nice in this image, but the main eye catcher of this area is the thin sheet metal of the wheel arch marked with red arrows. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Mustang 900R compact loader in its full digital glory. It took us about two hours to scan the entire vehicle. Throughout the scanning session, we accumulated 84 gigabytes of raw LEO data. For this project, we chose to record every fourth frame in HD and set the HD density parameter to 2.56 upon importing it into Artec Studio. The processing took place on the same computer as for the Mercedes, that's the one with the i9 CPU, 128 gigs of RAM, and an RTX 3060 graphics card. 
The HD reconstruction time for this vehicle took about two and a half hours. And here, same as we had for the Mercedes, a short screen video of the vehicle showcasing the results that we were able to obtain. The video runs for just a minute, so I'll let you take a look and come to your own conclusions. <clears throat> I can see the bucket, the front windshield wiper assembly that I showed you earlier, the wheels, those little hydraulic pipes above the wheels that were reconstructed perfectly, bolts on the wheels. So a lot of very small fine details that are visible really well on the scan and would have not been visible had the HD mode not been used. Here are those rare vents and then the headlights that we had to spray, obviously. Okay. And that was all the material that we had for today. So we now begin our Q&A session which means that if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat 